To introduce our speaker this evening, uh, this is James Scully, who has been involved with the Alfie Historical Society for forever. Isn't that right, James? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> James has research interests into the history of the Grand Canal in Offaly, Napoleonic fortifications in the Mid Shannon, and Banneher's literary association, especially Charlotte Bronte, Anthony Trollope, and more recently, Sir Matthew Dorenzi, who was the subject of tonight's lecture. Kieran Keenahan is a keen student of the historic landscape of West Offaly and a lover of cartography, particularly the River Shannon and its environs. And he has put together most of the slides that you will see this evening. So the, the uh, lecture title is County Offaly 400 years ago in the writings of Sir Matthew Dorenzi. And I'd just like to welcome now James Scully to take over and give us his lecture. Thank you, James. Hello, everybody in the room and those of you who are out in Zoom land. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to acknowledge at the very outset that the vast majority of this work has been done by Kieran Keenahan and it has been my honour here to present it tonight. We have worked together but an awful lot of the maps and illustrations that you'd see here are, are Kieran's work and I'd like to acknowledge his creativity, his genius and above all his humour when we do get together. So let's go off the 400 years ago in the writings of Sir Matthew de Renzi. The poster here on top just sort of to tell you that the arch enemies, the two arch enemies in this story are Sir John McCoughlin, the native, the Taoiseach of the McCoughlin clan of Delvanahara, the ancient Tua or territory of the McCoughlins, uh, now the barony of Gary Castle. And his nemesis, or the newcomer, Sir Matthew de Renzi, and a third party who will also feature in this is Sir William Parsons. Uh, McCoughlin's image there and de Renzi's image are conjectural, but that is a real portrait of Sir William Pier Parsons, who was very much involved with the plantations in West Offaly, Mid Offaly and South Offaly 400 years ago. But who was de Renzi? De Renzi is born in and in Cologne in 1577. He is a, a merchant uh, in Antwerp and then in London. And then he becomes a fugitive bankrupt. I repeat, a fugitive bankrupt. When he arrives in Ireland, according to himself, he has less than five pounds. But the year after, he meets with the Earl of Thomond and the MacBudicas. The MacBudicas are bards and chroniclers, fillers and poets in Thomond down near Limerick. The following year he marries for the first time Mary Adams and has one son, uh, Matthew Jr., whom we will meet later on. His second wife is Anne Mapader or Mapother. In 1613 he acquires land in Tononi. Now he just literally comes to Clononi. He doesn't have an army. He has a few followers. But using a title that he has bought, he establishes his title to the castle at Clononi and to surrounding lands. And they will appear again and again in his sort of struggle to ascertain his ownership to lands. In 1619, he moves to Dublin and he has a house on Wood Quay but he is still having impact in Offaly. He's knighted by the Lord Deputy Falkland, who has a fortification built in Banagher in his name. In 1628, he's one of the first 12 Burgesses of Banagher, and he is a member of that corporation the following year. So he's in, you know, in Banagher from sort of 16, 13, and 15 years later, 16 years later, he's on the borough, and then he dies as we will see uh, when we come to his obsequies in 1634. Now, for a fuller account, I would strongly recommend to you that you read the very fine article by Brian McCorta in the Dictionary of Irish Biography, published by the Royal Irish Academy. We are greatly indebted to the scholarship of Brian McCorta, who did a THD the um, newcomers to the Irish Midlands in UCG, the best part of 40, 50 years ago. And since that, he has written up the Renzi in various guises and in various journals. And it's his scholarship 
and the scholarship of Kieran Keenan that are responsible for a lot of the talk tonight. So we move on to a picture of Canoni Castle. And this was where Dorenzi came. Right? And he's living here, we'd say, from 1613 to 1620 and maybe coming back and forth to West Offaly. His nemesis, Sir John McCoughlin, lives only two miles away in what was a really very fine castle, a manorial home. And this is a splendid picture of it in 1790 by Francis Gross. Uh, we think this castle was destroyed by the Cromwellians in the 1650s, there were many other castles in, in, in West Offaly. So these two are, McCoughlin is the ancient Taoiseach, the ancient Gaelic leader holding on to his land and Derenzi is one of the newcomers. For a man, you know, I, what, what really surprises me about um, Derenzi is the impact and the influence he has. I suppose if I were to look at uh, the main object, initially anyway, of his writings is to blackguard the McCocklands so that they will come out bad and here he is, very early on, telling us that this territory of Delva McCoughlin is and was the mother of all rebellions. McCoughlin, and there's really, the writing here is quite legible, I hope for you. McCoughlin hath above 20 ploughlands. He has 11 castles in his own possession by wrongful and tyrannical, tyrannical hand. He's always undermining him, blackguarding him. And there you see at the bottom, for this territory is and was ever the mother of all rebellions. I don't want to be espousing bad language, but it didn't deter Dorenzi. For this man is but a bastard, begotten of dubbed bastardy. I thought it was doubled bastardy, but that's not. It's dubbed bastardy. His father was married to Malloy's daughter, and growing weary of her, put her away and took the daughter of Hugh O'Dallaghan, possibly of Cool Castle near Ferban, from her own married husband, and begot on her nine or ten bastards, whereof this Sir John is one. You must be very careful with the Renzi. He's a scoundrel. He's a rascal. He's a lovable rogue. But you have to be very careful about his writings and his behaviour. Again, we see him here. This is the sort of conjectural image of Sir John. He writes about Sir John. He was never true. He was a nun. August and all. So here is Dorenzi writing to the Lord Deputy in Dublin, the King's chief representative in Ireland, later the position of Viceroy, and he is writing two Irish words to try and describe Sir John McCoughlin. He is a non August and all. He is hither and thither. You just want to watch yourself with this guy. You've got to be very careful. So where is all this coming from? This comes from uh, the, the National Archives in Kew, outside London. Over a thousand pages of Matthew de Renzi's writings, mostly correspondence, mostly trying to establish title, but, and most important of all, I would think for tonight, 26 maps of County Offaly. He's a relative newcomer. But within a couple of years, and for the following 20 years, he is writing to the Lord Deputies, the chief officials of the English government in Ireland. Chichester, St John, Falkland and Falkland's wife, Elizabeth Carey. And finally, not Matthew Dorenzi Sr. himself, but his son takes on the mantle of scribe and he is writing to Wentworth. And also, there is regular contact with the Surveyor General from 1602 to 1641, Sir William Parsons, brother of Lawrence Parsons, uh, later of Parsonstown. All their signatures are repeatedly throughout the uh, Lorenzi manuscripts. Lorenzi is a magnificent linguist. Greek, 
Latin, French, German, Italian, English. August V. Goelge Eger Fresche. He's only his first year in Ireland, he learns Irish, and as we should see from his manuscripts, he's well able to speak it and he's well able to write it using the all the old the Shan Clo, the old print. So he's very well read and very well much travelled. The next slide shows his Irish in his, his, his signature in Irish script. Just the bottom line there, Matrugon de Renzi. And then we have a full slide. And we haven't attempted to uh, decipher this yet, but there's probably some enthusiastic and young undergraduate out there, and there's a very nice thesis to be done on the writings, the Irish, the Gaelic script writings of Sir Matthew de Renzi. Those of you who were in primary school before I was, or at the same time, would be familiar with the Shevus and the Sheena Fathers and so on. But what makes this very attractive for us, the Irish, is that he espouses the local place names, Craigan. And just to the right of the slide there on top, you would see the word Brosna. I don't know what it is with the Renzi. He's pretty good when it comes to the geography of Offaly, particularly West Offaly. But he calls four different rivers the Brosna. The Tullamore River the Rape Mills River outside Banagher and the Brosna itself. And normally uh, he isn't that careless with things, so there's something going on there. And here is in lovely uh, Gaelic script, Lum Cluna. And you will all probably think that Lum Cloon is the site of the old power station near Fraban, but Lum Cloon is something different. And here in, a, in contractions, Makara Biancar. The Plains of Banagher. And that was a name that was, we found repeatedly given to Banagher, the, the Makara, My Vanagher. And we'll come to a My Vanagher later on. Without going into great detail, I'm just going to run through a few of the beautiful place names. And these are place names somewhere around Moistown. Now you're just a mile away from Shannon Harbour and you're heading towards Shannon Bridge. And you get Buinan, B-U-I-G-H-N-E-A-N-N, -N, with the Bulcha on the G, Cool Quill, maybe the back of the wood. Stanga, Egg Bale on Oha, there's something. I don't know what Stanga quite is, it's to do with pegging out land. Maybe the plot, Egg Bale on Oha, at the mouth of the ford. And then, yeah, Stanga, Egg Bale on Oha, and then below that, on Taloon Gort Ukderok. Beautiful contractions, beautiful Gaelic script. And then this one, probably my favourite, on Tulchan, on Tulloch War, Tullamore, on Tulchan, on Ord Bjog. And he's describing this Tulchan, this hillock. This hillock. Unploughed for parley. This hillock, unploughed for a parley hill. So is this somewhere that the McCocklands might have gathered for a doll or for an assembly? And Derenzi, trying to undermine McCockland again, writes in one of his letters, Derenzi is pointing out again to St. John, the Lord Deputy, 22 years ago, he says, McCoughlin was appointed to the post of Seneschal. A post was created of Seneschal or Sheriff in West Offaly, in Delvin McCoughlin. But although he has an official English position, he is also having an inauguration for himself at Ardna Grossa, which we think is near Ahaboy just east of Fraban. As I said, he learned a lot of his Irish from the Macbudicas in Tormund. And they seemed to have been quite friendly, but they didn't know the Renzi. So friendly to the extent that Crohur Macbudica wrote a beautiful, well, 
love poem, praise poem, which you see here in the hands of Crohor MacBrudica. And all these manuscripts are in the Derenzi archives. And that poem was as follows. O blessing from me to Orenzi, give before you return to us the gentle scholar with hair of many tresses. May a cross of the Lord protect him. So that's Derenzi's uh, knowledge of Irish, his uh, friendship with the Macortas, well, sorry, with the Macbudicas, but he wasn't that fond of bards and chroniclers, as we'll see later. I'm going to move on now to another section where Derenzi is pointing out all the McCoughlin castles, all 28 of them. Sir John has 11 unto himself, and the others have 17. And he names every one of them. Gary Castle, built by Phelim Mwale, by Bald Phelim. Bail Alai, which is gone, one of the few of these castles that is completely gone, on a passage of land to Lusma and the water of the Shannon, just out the crank road from Banagher. He talks about Banagher itself there. He goes on to list Balia and Shrohan, Streamstown, Cool Finn, outside Banagher, Clahan, Rock Ron, upon the Shannon, Shannon Bridge, Gallon upon the Brosna. Cool upon the Brosna, Kinlegarna, north of Ferban, over towards Ballycumber, Rashana, or Rossini, Laka, not too far from Dune. And then he goes on to name the following castles are in the hands of the rest of the MacCochlans. Ballyan the Mullen, Milltown, on the road to Boris O'Kane from Clahan. Ballyan the Clucky, Stonestown, at the foot of Clahan Hill. Lis Clula, just out from Moystown. Cole and Feemy, we're not too sure. We're not too sure of that. And again, it's in beautiful Irish writing. Cluck and Nish, we don't know. Possibly Clonmac Noise. Clanona, Clanoni, Mystown upon the Brosna, Kilcommon and Listerg, very near Belmont, Fedden, also near Belmont, Bailla on Clare upon the Brosna, very near Ferban. Clonlion, again, on towards Shannon Bridge, Kincora upon the Brosna, built it by Sir Richard Tute, and the bone about it. The bone is the surrounding wall built by James Og Cochran. He names the two, ca the two castles in Kilcolgan, both built upon the Brosna, two castles upon one quarter of land. Le Monaghan, as we'll hear about later on, and Esker Castle. Esker Castle that is the one we associate with Moonies of the Dune. Up on the Esker, as you drive towards Athlone, and it has its wonderful um, shield in the gig. And then, curiously, this place at the bottom here, Drin, which, well, mystified us for quite a while until we were got to the maps. Just showing Drin again, and then in summation, Lorenzi is saying, in all, 28 castles, of which there is three broken, which with a small cost might be made up again. And the castles here that are not placed upon rivers have brooks and springs so there's no shortage of water so Kieran has put this map together the upper half the northern half of the barony of Gary Castle the territory of the McCocklands and there they are are all the castles along the rivers uh, the Shannon the Blackwater and the Brosnab and the rivers are the key in many ways to these maps because there are so few roads. So we will talk about the rivers later on. And uh, that's just this lower half of the barony of Gary Castle. And notice the abundance of castles along the Brosna. Kincora, Gallon, Valley, Clare, Clononi, Listcluny, Mystown, And then five castles around Banagher. So there were prolific castle builders. Uh, the, the McCocklands. So having uh, uh, sort of sent on that list, he also makes other observations. And these are observations to be considered. 
in the intended plantation of Delvin McCoughlin and Ferkel, the land of the Omelais in mid Offaly. And he's writing to the Lord Deputy, Sir John, and he says, here are notes and observations to be considered at this time of intended plantation, especially touching the ford of Banagher. Doesn't St. John look well there? So he goes along the River Shannon and he names all the various crossing points. Starting down at Limerick, he tells us, These be the ways for horse and foot to pass over the water of the Shannon. Limerick, Killaloo. Then right up, because of Loch Derg, you go from Killaloo and the next fording point is Mealick. And the next one is probably the most important ford upon the whole River Shannon. And it is called the Passage of a Harky and Anna Scurve. These are two fords on an island upon the Shannon, betwixt two fords. And that island is here. It's in Sharky Island, just above the new bridge, the new Weir Bridge at Mealing. You just come upstream. We're up on the drone here. We're looking down on in Sharky Island, looking from Galway into the parish of Lusma, and that is the island of Inshirky with its Napoleonic fortification from 1814 or 15. It's probably, we reckon, the highest piece of ground adjacent to the River Shannon between Limerick and Carrick and Shannon. And because of that, it was a major crossing point. When you came here from Bar, through Lusma, through Balanahar, a place you'll hear more about. You crossed the water you see on the right at Anna Scarif in Lusma onto this island and then you crossed the Shannon again at the ford of Keelog, which is just above uh, the, the great weir and the new bridge that was built at Mealick. This place is extremely historic. It was here perhaps that one of the major battles at the end of the Cromelian War took place in 1652 and there were many other battles since but that's for another day. So just looking down on a map from the 1830s you can see the Napoleonic fortifications on Inchirky Island which is in County Offaly and then across the eel weirs uh, you see the mills at Keelog and this was, a, was the major crossing point on the River Shannon. But the Renzi said he was going to write about Banagher. Banagher cometh next, a ford upon the Shannon, in old time very strongly fortified, with a very good and strong castle of stone and lime, and great trenches either side of the ford. It's not only about castles. Apart from land, I think uh, one of the most desirable things for a planter or a newcomer to take possession of were the weirs. They were extremely valuable. And we see this in the 1840s when they built the Great Shannon Navigation and these weirs are destroyed and the owners are very richly compensated. So these were highly prized. And here is Dorenzi under the heading of fishing telling us about the caro or the cora, I think, which is the word for a weir in Irish. The cora moor in Rockra, the weir of Caranua next to cora moor, and he goes on to name various chorus, Balemore, Watching, Calla, and these names, I'm afraid, elude us. But he does finally finish off by telling us there are eight other weirs in the river of the Shannon. And these were all extremely valuable and extremely important. Someone might help here. We think it's more than symbolic that if you want to show your title to land, or you plough it. So the Renzi was out ploughing one day within the shadow of Clononi Castle when two McCoughlins came upon him. Thalem and Gilla Duff. The said Thalem and Gilla Duff took him. The Renzi is writing about himself to the Lord Deputy to make the case about his suppliant, his petitioner. 
They said Phelim and Gulladuff took him by the collar, took his weapon from him, and they said Phelim, alias Far Gan Anum, drew his skin, and bending it to your suppliant's throat, swore he would presently dispatch him. Well, that's just an incident that uh, the Renzi wrote. The Renzi was very well read and he was quite a philosopher. And in the next section we will look at instructions for yourself. Now this is not, he's not, these are not for everybody. These are instructions he's giving to his son, Matthew Jr., who is about to go to Trinity College. And this is just extracts from what we might call Renzi's philosophy. Now remember this man is not to be trusted before I read on. Meddle with no man's goods, not for the value of a pin that belongs not to yourself. This vice belongs to such as the gallows is made for. Apply yourself day and night to your studies, for that is the only means that you must raise your fortune by. When you walk in the fields, learn to know all sorts of herbs. The herbals will teach you the quality of them. I wonder, was he aware of the great shields, the great herbalists in Ballyshale, just upstream from Tlenone? And did he have interaction with them? Keep yourself clean and always neat, and preserve your manuscripts well. We know from an inventory done of the Renzi's possessions after his death, that he had two large cases and a trunk. And we would assume that this is where he kept his papers and this is why they have survived. And we can enjoy them here tonight. So he's urging his son to preserve your manuscripts. Say your prayers, learn the seven Psalms and know the penitentials. Learn Euclid's elements, know your geometry, cosmography and astronomy. And when it comes to women, take heed you contract yourself with no woman. When I see time, I will take care for you myself. And he does. And he marries very well. Matthew Jr. marries a Tullamore woman, or a Crohan woman. He marries Sir John Moore's daughter, the oldest daughter, Mary. And the Renzi is so pleased that he writes this in his manuscripts. I have matched my son here into a good house. God be thanked to my own content, for he had diverse lords and knights to his near kindred. He has married into the local aristocracy. He has married the daughter of Sir John Moore of Tullamore. And John himself had married equally well. He had married the daughter of, of Archbishop Loftus, the first provost of Trinity College, a former Chancellor of Ireland who owned extensive lands in Crohan and from 1607 when he got lands from the Malloy sisters, uh, he had lots of lands around Tullamore. But all did not end well. Here we have a petition, very much in the style of his father, by Matthew Jr., again writing to another Lord Deputy, the famous Thomas Wentworth in November 1634. The writing is not as good as the father's, and it's very crowded. But I will just draw your attention to some of the names. Thomas Wakeley of Ballyburley Road. Thomas Sheen, the administrix of the will. Arthur Coughlin and Tullamore and John's daughter. These are all running through this letter. So what's going on in this letter? It's a bit of a saga. Sir John Moore of Tullamore and Crohan dies, having promised to Renzi Jr., who married his daughter, Mary, £200 as a dowry. Moore has died. Wakely of Ballyburley marries Thomasine and becomes Moore's executor. Wakely dies 
And who comes along and marries the widow? One of the McCocklands. That does not augur well. And we still do not know until we maybe find another manuscript in this collection. We haven't read it all thoroughly. Kieran has done a power of work. But we still do not know, or maybe did Matthew never get his dowry. But he still got the reaction of Thomas Wentworth, the Lord Deputy, who wrote from Dublin Castle in 1634. They said Arthur Cochrane and Thomasina, his wife, must present satisfaction to the plaintiff, or failing for to do so, appear forthwith before me and show cause to the contrary. So again, here you have Dorenzi Jr. and able to get the Lord Deputy. Now, arising out of this, and wh why wasn't the £200 paid? An inventory was done of Sir John's household at Crohan. Whereas, was, you know, the money is there, why can't you pay it? So we have this very detailed inventory, which Breen McCorter, whom I've acknowledged already, has published, and we are the beneficiaries of that. And again, all of this is in the Dorenzi manuscripts. Here it is in its original form. And we're just focusing on this aspect of it. It's a whole infantry of his household goods and so on. But we're just going to focus on the farm animals and the different values that they had. It's hard to read, so we'll go to the text. 13 great cows, eight pounds, nine shillings. 120 shillings in a pound, 169 shillings, so a cow is worth 13 shillings. Heifers, 5 shillings. Bulls, plough oxen, the most valuable animals, apart from one white riding gelding, which was valued at three pound, the most valuable horses or animals are the two mill horses, and they are valued at two pounds, 10 shillings. And that's a wonderful insight, we think, just to the agriculture and the value of animals and there, there's a whole talk to be given on that. So we're going back to a map. This is a relatively modern map in, to the extent that it is based on the 1838 map and it's very, very near Tullamore. If you go out towards Rahu, you go to Balladaly and Balacosney, Tinny Cross and Carton East and so on, all those townlands there. The two blue rivers, the blue river at the top of the picture with the water mill, that's the Silver River. Now this is the North Silver River. There are two Silver Rivers in Offaly. The one coming down from the Sleeve Blooms through Cadamstown, Ballyboy, Kilcormac, that's the South Silver River. This is the North Silver River coming in from Rahu towards Doro on towards Ballyduff, Coona Hiley and so on to join the Bosna down below Rahan. So this is Matthew Jr.'s land from, um, from 1641. It's something you can get from Trinity College about the Downs Rubber. So these were his, one, two, three, four, six townlands. These were his lands in 1641. And that's the uh, map of 1838. And the mill is still there. Today, it was there in 1838. And when we look at this map of that area, it's turned upside down because the orientation is different. So this is Ballycowan Barony, out towards Tinney Cross, Ballon the Shra, out towards Balladaly and all of that. And this was drawn by several surveyors whom we're going to meet. Thomas Graven, uh, John Gwynn and others. So we'll come back to that map in a moment. And in the meanwhile, we're going to move on to what we think are the highlights of this collection. Uh, the Barony maps of the Barony of Ballycown, Ballyboy and English. In other words, um, as the National Archives described them, they say there's 26 rough maps showing uh, Ballyboy, Ballycown and English baronies and also areas in West Offaly. So the next slide will just show you in different colours. We have the Barony of Ballycown, sort of going from Ballycumber to Tullamore, and beneath that Ballyboy, uh, sort of between Scregan, Muckla, and Kilcormac, 
and then between Kilcormac and Burr, the barony of Eglish. And then the barony, we don't have a map of the barony of Gary Castle, but we have dozens of maps of s small areas that were going to be the subject of grants of land to uh, various uh, planters, newcomers and Lord deputies. So we're going to take a close look now, if I may, at the map of Ballycowan. Now, all these townlands are very familiar to me from my childhood. Tullamore, Ballard, and so on. And maybe to help you get your head around it, we've put in the rivers. The rivers have been deepened, and to some extent they might have been straightened but for the most part, their courses and their routes hasn't changed that much. So you have the Barony River, a small river going under the canal, joining the Tullamore River uh, out in Cap and Cor. Then the Tullamore River, which the Renzi calls the Rosna, flows towards Kilgorton, Ballycown, to meet the Claudia, which has come in through Muckla. And they combine and then they move on towards Goldsmith Lot, on the Grand Canal around uh, Ballon uh, sort of west of Rahan, and there it joins with the Silver River coming in from the north, and then they cruise on towards the Brosna. And further downstream in the Brosna, the South Silver River comes in uh, from the sleeve blooms and all of that. Getting back to the map of 1620, we see in the bottom corner a mill. And that mill is still there. And I want to thank Pat Gavigan. And hopefully sometime when the weather has improved, we can have a field trip to Tinney Cross Mill. There's a lot of that mill. And it may not be the original 17th century mill, but there's a lot of that mill surviving. And there's an awful lot of history to go with it. Ballinashrat townland there in which the mill sits is more or less roughly a rectangle. But in 1838, a tongue of land has been added onto it. You can just see it coming out to the right there. And that's where the mill race. It was very important that you owned the mill race for your mill. So we think the configuration of that townland was sort of changed. And here it is in 1838. We're out in Derry Golan or Balnamona in Doro, Carton East. And there is the mill race at Balnishra or Tinney Cross um, Mill. Moving back to Tullamore, we're not too sure. You can see a, a whole lot of dotted lines going to possibly a summit, possibly the top of the hill of Antullach War. We don't know. They're not contours, we think. They may be drains. But look at all the town land names that you know, and that are still more or less the same in size and shape. Ballard, Killeen Row, Shra, Arden Beg, Ballydrehid. I always thought Ballydrehid, out the canal, out west of Tullamore, got its name from the canal bridges. This is a much older name, and there's Ballydrehid Moor and Ballydrehid Berg. And on close examination, you can see the castle of Tullamore and the bridge of Tullamore. Somewhere right on the river, the castle is standing. Maybe somewhere near where the bridge house when I'm we're not sure. And then it also shows Shrahi Kern, which of course is Shrach Castle, built or was it built? Was it built by John Briscoe? Well, there's a date stone from it in Mount Briscoe. 1588, but is that a marriage stone? It says J, B and E, K, John Briscoe, Eleanor Carney. So it's Shrach E. Cairn. It's the Shrach Castle of the Kearneys and later the Briscoes. Another very familiar town lands there, Bally Cowan, Kilgorton and so on. So we move further into this map and we move from yeah. uh -huh. 
Yeah, we're moving towards Line Alley. And this is where you have the confluence of the Tullamore River and the Claudia. Uh, the river, the Renzi does something quite peculiar with them there, which you can see Line Alley. And you can see the Church of Kilbride. And the churches, for the most part, are delineated as roofless buildings. The Church of Rahan is there, the Church of Line Alley, and the Church of Kilbride. Scregan is there. Glasgow is there, Bally Drinnen, Bally Keenehan and Ahadonna, all very familiar townlands in Rahan. My own grandfather lived in a place called Kilgurton Mill. So here we have in 1620 a mill. And to be honest, I'm not too sure which of the rivers it's on there, but I think his mill was there. The one he, not his, I can tell you, but the one he occupied, so we just put it like that. Um, was on a stream off, uh, uh, very nearby, but, but not on the actual Claudia River itself. So, we're still in Ballycown and looking at detail. We're looking now at Kilbride and Ballinamere and all of that. And not on the map, of course, is Ballycown Castle, because it's not built till 1626. And we think the, this map would certainly uh, predate that. So, just to finish off with the map of Ballycowan, we were much intrigued with the word in capital letters. Clun Keen. K-L-W-N. Clun. Keen. Not too sure where that is. And it's just across the river, so it might be in a different barony. I think we're into... Uh, Somewhere possibly near, we're getting near Ballycumber, Kilmanahan and Newtown, and then you see McCochran's territory and so on. And the last thing I think we would uh, look at on this map of Ballycowan is on, we're on the Brosna again and we're looking at McCochran's country and Erie Fox country. So you're talking about the barony of Kilcorsey towards Clara. And then two mills upon the river Brosna at Drin. And we are more or less sure that maybe, possibly, Drin is an earlier name for Ballycumber. We think that as two mills on the river Brosna at Ballycumber. And they were there in 1838. A tuck and a flour mill. The black dot there is Connie Hanifee's house at Ballycumber and there's eel weirs and so on. And the map at Bally, or sorry, the bridge at Ballycumber, according to drawings in 1844, these are very important drawings of old bridges in Offaly because these bridges are gone four years later in a huge drainage scheme which is replicated exactly 100 years later between 1948 and 1954. The two schemes go on for about six years each, or a century apart, and the rivers, they're not diverted that much, but they are certainly deepened, and a lot of the floodwaters are controlled. But we would like to think that the arches there to the left might have been the arches for the eel weirs at the two mills at Ballycumber. So, we're going to have a look at more maps, and this time we're sort of concentrating on, uh, I think we're moving into West Offaly. Um, so William Parsons is the Surveyor General from 1602 to 1641. He is an extremely powerful man, particularly, I think, after 1641, he becomes the Lord Justice. The Lord Deputy has to be replaced. So two Lord Justices are put in. So he's one of the two men literally in charge of the country. And as Surveyor General, well, let's just say he was in the position to, to influence the distribution of these lands. But who decides what's where? Who does the surveying? So we have Raven and Gwyn, Morris and Stubbs, and they're all around Mid and West Offaly in the 1620s. And their names are everywhere. The maps seem very... Compared to what these surveyors could do, and we will have a look at Thomas Raven's work in the city of Derry and in 
other parts of Ulster. These are sort of, I won't say, they're, they're just drafts, but it's a very important field work and so on. But everywhere you're getting clues if you scroll over them. And you get Morris here on, on that map. Gwyn on that map, just at the edge. And we reckon if it's inside the line where the townlands are drawn, that John Gwynne did that map. Sometimes the names are outside. And we reckon, well, he's probably doing the next barony or the next area. And here I have just north of Tullamore there, inside the circle, Thomas Raven. Now, this is the barony of Ballycowan. It's upside down. When we look at a map now, we like north on the top, south, uh, east and west. Well, that's the orientation we're, we're used to. So it's a bit confusing. So what we've done here is we've superimposed Gwyn, we think it's John Gwynne's map of the barony of Ballycowan and put it on a late 19th century map. It has the railways and so on. So we think it's, it's a late 19th century map. And it all fits pretty well Except when I was talking to Helen earlier today, Doro seems not to be there. So that's just, it's that, that explains that green patch at the top. But otherwise, these maps are quite accurate and uh, we think are extremely important. One of them had on the reverse, when you're in the archives, it's very important to look both sides. That's why you say, we couldn't, you know, get them digitised or whatever and get them sent over. But if, sometimes if you go and uh, things that can be sort of overlooked. So on the back of a map was this Drin, this, this enigmatic, enigmatic name, Drin and the Monaghan. So we're going right into the heart of West Offaly now, particularly the parish of the Monaghan. So on the back of a, one of the maps was this, Drin and the Monaghan and this received from the surveyors, five plans. Le Monaghan, Endrum, north of Ferban and, and its adjacent town and Craiglin. Driss Ternan, anybody? A town name that's gone. The town, place name that's gone. Clanona. And, intriguingly, Castle Anne de Renzi. Who was Anne de Renzi? The second wife. So let's see if we can find out what's going on. So these maps uh, cover this area here between Ballycumber and Dune and Ferban. And we're going to have a look at some of these in detail. Could I have water? Uh, it's over on the floor, I think. <clears throat> and again, uh, yes, I've mentioned the surveyors. Yes. Right. Thank you. So, as I said, yeah, the main surveyors, and here they are again, uh, here they are again Raven and Gwyn, and their names are all over the maps. And there's some very fine, uh, uh, very, very fine script here. And I'd like you to take a close look at these names. Kilnagarna, Ballystra, Ballystra is no longer on any map. It's a place name. Maybe it's there in the oral memory, and all the better if it is. Kilnagulan is on the Ordnance Survey maps. Stra Duff, but again, just Turner is not, and neither is Loch and Lee. Roshina is there, but not Gobsick. But the name on this map is Sir Matthews. Sir Matthews. So this is Thomas Raven picking out a nice piece of upland. If you go from Roshina to Valley Cumber, you're on the upland, you're on the Boher Fada, that lovely bit of upland that looks down on the great bogs of the Monaghan. And it's going to be for Sir Matthew and also for the last word you can see on that page, Lord Grandison. Lord Grandison is the Lord Deputy St. John. We have sort of moved in little bits of maps there. These houses intrigue us. Again, some of them are not roofed, some of them have crosses, and some of them looked like towers on a sort of an out, a rocky outcrop. So we're not too sure of what 
these surveyors who were well able to draw, who knew what they were looking at. This is not, these things are not invented, as you will see, with the calibre of work that they were capable of. This was tricky. Uh, it's just a little, uh, a mirroring, I think is the word that's used. A mirror at Derry and Dahi, which we think is very near Derry and in Pulla. But other townlands are familiar to you there, I hope. Again, near Fraban, Kilcolgan, Ross Farahan and Derrica as you come out from Verbanna and heading through Ballycumber and Stubbs' his name is there, again one of the surveyors. Another plantation map coming up, Le Monaghan, listing the townlands and the lands that are for Dorenzi and St John and I think we've looked at that. But these houses are different, they're better looking, they're roofed, chimneyed and so on and they're, uh, well, possibly Kirnagarna, and again you get those lovely handwriting and the townlands, three of which are lost, well for the moment maybe to history and three that are still there. So I'll move on quickly here if I may. And then again this is yet another map of the Monaghan, a much wider area uh, giving us, um, well moving, moving across into Westmead to Walter White's land at Bullenakill. Bullenakill, we didn't know where Bullenakill was until we found it was in Melochlan's country, not McCochlan's country. And when you're in Melochlan's country, you've gone from Offaly and you've gone into Westmead. So there you see Drim again, showing a castle, and land belonged to Walter White, whom we will meet later. Mm. And then this is all very vague. This is Cora Cullen, and the land here was belonged to Owen O'Mooney. And then we look at uh, back down to the Bosna and we're looking at Ballycumber. The main focus of this map was Le Monaghan, and this is what Dorenzi was recommending for the Lord Deputy. And the figures are there. Raven or whichever of the surveyors, they have accurately calculated and it's going to be 392 acres of arable land and 1488 acres of bog. The church is roofed and the castle is in its right position behind it. I think you can see that there. Le Monaghan is a sort of an island and the church is roofed and the castle is just to the north of it. So the orientation on that map seems to be regular enough. And this is the castle uh, as it was taken uh, in the Bidulf uh, pictures that Mike Byrne did the great book on very recently. Lovely picture, very like cool, very defensive, narrow windows and so on. And it was here at the, this very same time that the annals of Clonmac Noise were written possibly within a few years of these maps. Conan McGagan, the brother-in-law of Terence McCoughlin of Kilcolgan. Would Dorenzi have met the analysts? It's a question. And finally, just another picture there before. Um, yes, that lovely, uh, what would you call that, of turf? No, it's a rick of hay, but it's a clamp, is it? Lovely clamp of turf. Uh, at Le Monaghan Castle. So these guys are wonderful surveyors and they're out, we would imagine, in all sorts of weather and getting the surveying done. And here we see my, the minutest of calculations. And I'll just scroll over a few of these while I take a drink. You can see long multiplication and so on. And uh, that we're going to look at the actual plantation itself. Uh, I will have a brief, brief look at some of the other work 
of the surveyors. So this slide is just to give you a summary of the way things were. The surprising thing about the plantation is, uh, and we look at this, is that the McCocklands hold on to most of their lands. I think only a quarter of the land is sort of taken from them and distributed among a handful of newcomers, five or six. And you can see here in 1641, 20 years after the plantation, that Dermot Coughlin and uh, all the other Coughlins and Owen Mooney uh, own, own, are owning an awful lot of the land still in West Offaly. One feature which we were, um, were hoping to find on the maps is this magnificent ancient tower, which goes uh, sort of not from the Monaghan uh, um, church and, and, and uh, his, um, Monaghan's mother's church, but a little further east, parallel to the main road from Ferban to Ballycumber. And it's a very ancient road that goes back thousands of years and has been, uh, has been documented by archaeologists and uh, was there, certainly was there in the 17th century. And it's quite visible today, and it's, uh, thank, mercifully, it has uh, escaped the, the board and the morning machines, and it's a very fine monument. It's about a mile long, and it, it, there's quite a lot of, of it to be seen. So, again, just to look closer at these eminent surveyors who were in Offaly in the 1620s. This is uh, Thomas Raven, uh, you know, he, his work is just, it's, it's fantastic. It's artistic and it's exotic. And here's an example of what he was able to do. What we have in Offaly are just, I'm afraid, his field notes and maybe uh, more rough drafts back wherever he worked from. Did he work from Clononi or what? We don't know. But this is a Thomas Raven map of the city of Derry. And uh, that's only done maybe 10 years before he is in West Offaly. Queen Street and Silver Street, all the houses are there. Have a close look at the syllable lock. The River of Loch Foyle. Have a look at the L-O-U-G-H. And then have a look at this. The bottom word is Loch and Lee. And the calligraphy is identical. Um, we're beyond doubt that Thomas Raven did that map. He also did a very fine map. You will remember earlier I talked about Vanaher being called my Vanaher. There are 24 Bannahers in Ireland at the moment, and we're still counting. And most of them are soft, gently curved, round hills with an archaeological feature. And this is one of them, just above the River Ban. Sorry, on the River Ban, immediately above sort of Loch Ney and the Bridge of Toom. And that's Thomas Raven's map of my Bannaher up in Derry or Antrim, depending on which... And again, that dates to 1622. And look at the houses. And they're very like the houses that we saw in Kilnagarna. We don't know who, you know, who was living in these or what, but it's great that they survived 400 years later and that they can add to the history of the county. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just a close-up of the Kilnagarna houses by Thomas Raven. John Gwynne. We're not too sure. There's something going on here. He does five or six maps of Banagher. Derenzi's writing is on them as well. And we're not too sure what's going on here. But on one of them, <coughs> he points out, or draws in, uh, a medieval town of Banagher. And we, 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 can't, we can't find it in the history. We can't find it in documentation. And, well, if it's in the town, we don't quite know. Nobody has ever moved to preserve medieval Banagher. And if you compare the, um, the medieval references to Melik, for example, 
are in scores. The medieval references to Banagher are rather few. But this map, which uh, the Renzi done, is in to a, it's a reply to a request from the Burgesses. Banagher becomes a borough in 1629, and the Burgesses want, you know, they want uh, the Burgesses of Banagher want to lay out the corporation land and so on. And John Gwynne is given the task of doing that. And this is his map here. And this is, we think, 1628, right? Uh, there's nothing on that about a medieval town. And we see John Gwynne's signature. So his signature is all over here. Um, and I'll come on to that map in a moment. On one of his maps there, I might come to it later, he talks about the old town, the old English town of Banagher. And far be it from me to diminish in any way the history of Banagher, but it, it, it just isn't in the documents and it's not really on the ground. So we can't figure out, is Dorenzi or whoever saying, well, this was an English town long before it was an Irish town and it's going to be an English town again. Is it part of the case for plantation? Maybe not. I might come to it later on. This is another survey near Clahan, and again, it's utterly amazing. This is about a small, few small townlands, and uh, Dorenzi is able to uh, write to William Parsons in Dublin, a very important man, surveyor general, going to be one of the, the, the Lord Justices, and he's making a decision about lands sort of between Clahan and the Bosna. And John Gwynne is to get in there and sort it out. And a lovely map, just showing us how, um, how the work was done. You can just see the chains and so on. And these are sort of field survey notes on the Bosna for uh, towns well, that are familiar to those down there. Ballyshan, Ballylochan, Camus and Galros. And they're all written very clear there. Camus on the west of the Bosna. And you can just see how... The surveyor goes with his chains and offsetting and all of that. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right up. And the land is laid out. So, as we were saying earlier, there were three plantations, if you like, at the time. West Offaly, uh, Delvin McCoughlin, South Offaly, Eli O'Carroll, and North Offaly, Ferkel O'Malley which is saying some of those lands have been granted well in, well in advance of these plantations. Lots of newcomers, but very few to West Offaly. Only six are given land, six newcomers. Lord Grandison, uh, the Lord Deputy, Sir Thomas Rotherham, a military engineer, Arthur Blundell, who lives in Banagher and was responsible for the fort there, Thomas Prescott, Captain Thomas Webb, and Walter White. And that's just from a commission. There was an inquiry because there was sort of, uh, things weren't done properly and people were getting more land than they should have and regulations were broken. So we have a very detailed inquiry into these plantations and this is the sort of detail that we get. And this was published by the Irish Manuscripts Commission and so on. So they are the newcomers that come into West Offaly. And here are the locals, the natives, as Dorenzi would call them. So John McCoughlin, 4,000 of arable land and 3,000 of bog. O'Shields, Cochlins, Dallahans, Malachlins, Moonies, Murtas, and so on. But the man who uh, sort of gained most was the Lord Deputy himself. And by modern computation, by modern computation, he gained about 5,000 acres, mostly around Le Manahan, despite the plantation regulations that he was not to, uh, to receive such lands. So his lands are the ones that I've been showing you, uh, just turning on all those townlands. Uh, other maps now, uh, these, this is the Blackwater River. Uh, coming down through, through West Offaly, near Entrum, Cregan, Ban. All these names are on the map. My Clare, Clonline and Clonfanla. I'm 
I'm going to move on now to a map that puzzled us for a long time because, as I said earlier, Lumcloon, to me and to others, was that area of land where Forban Power Station was. And you could upset some by calling it Forban Power Station. And you could upset others by calling it Lumcloon Power Station. But we thought it was over there until we come on this map. And this is Lumcloon now, Sir Arthur Brundell's land. So when we look closely at this, we see Lumcluna is beside Clononi, and Clononi is beside the Brosna. And then we look more closely at this map, and it's where the Brosna flows into the Shannon. And it's Shannon Harbour, and it's Minas Island. With that point below, just where the Grand Canal enters into the Shannon, that's Bullock Island or Minas Island, they're all the one. So here we see Lumcluna, and it is described as the greatest ploughland, and here it is on the uplands between Banagher and Cahan. And it's a different Lumcloon to the one we talked about. That was bogland, flatland, lowland, over near the power station. And Kieran has done this map to try and give us the bearings of it. So there you can see in the green, Lumcluna, Arthur Blundell's land, just coming up from the Shannon uh, at Shannon Harbour, and sort of in between Clochan and uh, Coolfin, all that very fine farms in Beliver, Park, and other townlands at that. Other lands were given to, uh, this is the lands given to Thomas Rotherham, and it's all those uh, fine townlands near Shannon Bridge. Uh, Rotherham, uh, who was uh, one of the surveyors, in a way, he was a military engineer. He gets 2,000 acres, but he sold it all to Thomas Lestrange. And the Lestranges were a big, big family in West Offaly afterwards. Uh, the man in the greatest position to do well for himself would have been this man, Sir William Parsons, Surveyor General. Yeah, he's also very much involved in a commission for defective titles. And this is where Domenzi and others, they come in and say, well, look at just show us your papers, will you? What title have you here? Mm, yeah, well, well, we'll have to talk about this and so on. And this was a body detested by the Irish. St. John's and the Parson brothers, William and Lawrence, got by far the biggest share. Uh, not only in County Offaly, but you can see from this map, uh, William got lands, well, Wicklow, Leitrim, Longford, North Ulster, and, and so on. But for all of that, he still has loads of time um, to, you know, to get John Green and John Woodhouse, yet another surveyor, to come down and draw detailed maps of lands around uh, Banagher. So this is just uh, a list of townlands which William Parsons got in other counties as well. Uh, they tend to be quite extensive. So I'm going to move on now, uh, hopefully getting towards the end. Uh, Derenzi is, is as important for geography as for history. And while I said earlier, there were, you know, the rivers are the key to, to the maps, there were a few roads. And Derenzi said, these are very important. There was only three ways, we reckon, in and out of West Offaly. And he calls them ballocks. And that's the Irish word for a way in or a way out. Balak Anahar, which is between the rape mills, between Bor and Banahar. Balak Loch Quill, and there's still a townland of Loch Quill if you're going from Dune to Athlone, not on the present road. Balak Drin, this is Drin again, if you turn right in Dune and you're going to Ballycumber. And the Renzi says, these ways must be secured, whereby the undertakers or the planters may have quite going out and be safe coming in. So there we have, Kieran has drawn this map of the Ballock from Ferban up towards Dune, Esker, and then the Ballock Drin going from Dune onto uh, Ballycumber or Drin. We're into uh, 
that onto the drone here, looking down on Dune Crossroads. And you have Esker Castle, that's the castle up on the hill, and then you have the Ridge Road, and that's the Ballock Drin that takes you all the way to Ballycumber. Uh, this is, again, another one of Kieran's maps. Dorenzi says, if you're going from Banagher to Clonone, you must go to Stonestown and Clahan. Because if you turn left, where we would now go to Shannon Harbour and so on, he said, you, be, you must be stripped to the waist. You're only going into the morass of the bog and the callows and so on. So that's the road. This is the road that he, he, he lays out when you're going from Banagher to uh, Clanone, to his own castle and what really galled him was when he was going from Banagher to Clanone that he had to pass Sir John McCoughlin's very fine manorial uh, house. So I'm just going to have a quick glance. There are other barony maps and they are, I think, subject for another night. This is the Barony of Ballyboy, which shows Kilcormac, uh, Raleen, Rathmurra, uh, Ballincar, and Ballygowan, and all those, uh, all those uh, townlands that are around Mount Bolas. Yeah, let's look at the Abbey of Kilcormac is there. And then we move on to the Barony of Eglish, moving towards Bar. Uh, not as much detail on this map. It was a bit disappointing, but it does show us that very fine island, uh, where there was an island castle in Shakura, the last stronghold uh, of the Confederates in the, in the 1650s. Uh, and it's still there. And that's where the great Dowris hold was found in the 19th century. So you can just see the island in the, in the bog there and the word Duras. And then a few more maps around for Ban showing Nogus and so on. Again, areas uh, along the Bosna. Um, this was the one that intrigued us. We didn't quite know what this was. It wasn't an area and it's only when we read the fine detail on the margin that this is Castle and Renzi. This was a castle that was built for uh, Renzi's second wife uh, and is gone. And if there's anything left, it may be under Maestown House. Somewhere there, there is another Maestown Castle which is nearer the river, but we think um, Castle and Renzi was roughly where Maestown House was. So the importance of the Renzi is for the old place names, for the Gaelic script, for places that are lost to history, in particular Drin and the new version of Lumcloon. And the Renzi, just as if to confirm this, calls it Lumcloon, and here he is in Irish writing Lumcluna na Flatira. The best and greatest ploughlands. This is the best land. And if you know the land above Banagher, you, you would be inclined to agree with um, the Renzi. So Lum Clunan La Fatira is an extensive area of upland near Banagher and not the more recent version. Right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to go back to this controversial map of John Gwynne, briefly. Banagher, an old English town. We're not too sure this could be a con job. There's something going on here. Here it is, Banagher, the old English town. Twelve plots for houses. It doesn't exist in the, the documentation and there's very little of it on the ground. And then, uh, for all his friendship with the MacBrudicas, writing about the bards, he said the trouble with the Irish is 
they know too much of their history. And better it were, better it were fit, that these bards were drowned, whereby they might not know in time, whereby they, the Irish, may not know in time from whence they came. That map showing the uh, medieval or the old town of Banagher is signed Juan Gallo. There's no such person. But this is John Gwynne's signature. And the map is in John Gwynne's style. And we would have little about that. So just to finish up, and maybe that might be in for a more detailed discussion. Dorenzi dies in Wood Quay on the 29th of August, 1634. By any standards, his funeral was lavish. It cost £247. This is the man who arrived in Ireland with a fiver or less. What is the most important expense in the funeral? Entertainment? Drink? No. Cloth. Everybody is to get an outfit. Everybody. So, all the cloths, I think, are ordered well in advance. It was very important that you were ready to die, that everything was ready. You got your memorial made. You might have got several memorials. All this clothes and cloth, seven and a half yards of fine cloth, 25 and a half yards of cloth, to L's, 13 L's of rich taffeta. You know the saying, if you give someone an inch, they'll take an L. It's not a mile. An L is 45 inches. 30 yards of Padua, 17 and a half yards of silk mohair, 6 penny ribbons, 8 penny ribbons, and 12 penny ribbons. Dozens of them. I just hope they were black. The ladies were to be togged out to the full. This is um, Elizabeth Carey on the right, a genuine picture. And then Mary Law, uh, Lady Mary de Renzi, Matthew Junior's daughter, she's on the left. And that's just a conjectural drawing. But we do know that she was to get an extravagant French gown, which was to cost five pounds. And here it is, all laid out for dejeweling the cloak, for making three gowns for my lady, for making three gowns for the maids. And even the old servant is to get an outfit. And we have this conjectural reconstruction of Matthew Jr. himself admiring his outfit for the funeral. St. Patrick's Cathedral. The bell ringer is paid a pound at the most expensive funerals in England and Dublin at the time, five shillings. But he seemed to have been ringing for days. Derenzi is very concerned that people know. He's very concerned about his status and a very elaborate memorial was built for him, not in Dublin, but in Athlone. And little of it survives. This is all that survives. A very interesting inscription. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, and of course, it's need, we need to add here that Derenzi did have properties in Athlone, but the church in Athlone was built by his old friend, St. John, the Lord Deputy. So the memorial is built and we think this is just a small fragment of it. They were into big memorials at this stage, particularly Richard Boyle of Cork and others. So here's the receipt which survives for the memorial. Receipt for the making and setting up of a memorial in Athlone. Francis Andrews, a Dublin sculpture who worked in Back Lane near the Taylor's Hall, not far from Christchurch Cathedral. 
and the monument costs £40, 10 shillings. And it's still to be seen, the remains of it, in St Mary's, opposite the Prince of Wales in Athlone. And it's, it's a very elaborate script, tightly compacted, and among the many claims on it are that he is descended from that great warrior, Skanderberg, who fought 52 battles against the Turk. Now, how is that for pedigree? Very important to have pedigree. We think this may have been a drawing of the memorial, but it's a problematic. What we have that survives, the stone is much curved, and it's not like that, but, um, you know, we would imagine that his memorial was fine enough, but not as fine as Richard Boyle's in St. Patrick's Cathedral. This is taller than most houses and was just one of five memorials, and I think most of them survive. Dungarvan, Yall, and so on. He was a cousin, uh, a cousin of William Parsons and a good friend of the Renzies. So I think all his family are there and so on. And I'm not too sure, but I think this, some of them were done well in advance. And Sir John McCoughlin, the first, we're talking about the second Sir John McCoughlin. Sir John McCoughlin, the first, who died in 1590, is buried in Banagher. And his memorial was made in the 19th year of Queen Elizabeth's reign. 1576, 14 years before he died. Why? Well, you never know what might happen when you're gone. Sure, nothing might happen. So just to finish up, the Renzi is very important about his status in society, and he pays this man. This is a receipt from Albon Leverett Athlone. Now, we don't think this man is from Athlone. It's just that he was the pursuivant if that's the French word, the pursuivant at arms, it's a heraldic office, like the Ulster King at arms, something like that. And he's, a, he's an official that, you know, makes sure that, you know, when I die, that everything is entered properly and I don't lose any of my status and my genealogy and so on, and that my son's legitimacy is verified. So the Renzi consolidates his status having his dirt certified by a heraldic officer. 1634, a five pounds. Probably 50,000 pounds now, we don't know. Certainly multiples of thousands of pounds. So the script tells us that he was descended from Skanderberg, who fought 52 battles with the great conquest, with great conquest and honor against the great Turk. He was, as I have already said, a great traveller and a general linguist. He also, according to his memorial, composed a grammar dictionary and a chronicle in the Irish tongue. Now, some of the experts in Gaelic scholarship have looked at this and they said, no, he's borrowing from maybe some bards in Sligo and maybe with the connivance of the MacBudicus. So to finish off, finally, just a look at his legacy. Yeah, just the final part of his inscription. Uh, yeah, this work was accomplished by his son uh, uh, just a year after his death. So, just to close with his legacy, at the outset, Lorenzi was a fugitive, a bankrupt fugitive. He has the funeral of a peer. When the inventory is done in his house and his accounts afterwards, he leaves £1,007 in gold and silver and £504 in silver plate. Two expensive wooden chests and one trunk, perhaps to preserve his documents. And hence, we have the wonderful maps and letters of West and mid Offaly that I hope we have enjoyed here tonight. Finally, it's to thank Kieran Keenehan for all he does done for the presentation, and Breen McCorta, who did his thesis 40 plus years ago on newcomers to the Irish Midlands, 
and then produced various articles on the Renzi, which are all to be got in JSTOR or in the library here in Awfully History. So I will close, and I'm sorry if I went on, but Kieran and I thought that this was worth sharing with you, and hopefully you cherish it half as much as we do. So thanks to all. Ooh. Wow.